Good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here for worship in this season after Pentecost. Wherever you are, we're glad that you're joining us for worship virtually today. Today, we are going to take communion together. So I hope that you have your elements ready. You can use any kind of bread. If you don't have bread, you could use a cracker and uh, grape juice or any kind of juice if you don't have grape juice. Also, I hope that you place a mask on your, with your elements, close to your elements, because thinking about masks and blessing them and remembering why we wear them is going to be part of our liturgy for communion today. A couple of things. Uh, my name is Reverend Stephanie Vader, one of the pastors here at Emmanuel. With me is Reverend Leo Yates interpreting and doing the sound and the video for us is May Vader. So we're glad you're here. So a couple of things, the scavenger hunt items, let me read them to you. They all have to do with the story of Jonah. They all have to do with the story of Jonah. So I hope that you will find them and talk about or think about what they have to do with that story. There is a fish, a sun, a boat, a worm, and the number 40. A fish, a sun, a boat, a worm, and the number 40. And they're all related to the story of Jonah, which is our scripture lesson today. I hope that you will take some time and fill out the online cards that you'll find on our website. That's where you can fill out guest information cards. You can also fill out joys and concerns cards. Reverend Kim Capps, one of our pastors, updates the joys and concerns list and it's mailed out every week to you if we have an email address for you. We continue to collect food for the Lars Food Bank. Rod Sams continues to pick it up from the carport of our ministry center. You leave the food on one of the picnic tables that is on the carport and Rod will take it to the food bank. Lars is also looking for a few volunteers. They have in place all sorts of sanitation, social distancing measures, and they need a few volunteers to work in the food bank and help them. If that's something you could do, please contact Lars directly and let them know. Our green team is selling off the Equal Exchange Fair Trade Tea, Coffee, and Chocolates that they have left. And so please reach out to them if you want to purchase some. We are studying and learning from a new book this summer. Last summer, we read White Fragility and then had discussion groups about it. This summer, we are going to read the book called Trouble I've Seen. It's by Dr. Drew Hart, who is a professor of theology at, and black studies at Messiah College in Pennsylvania. And uh, Drew Hart is going to be our preacher later on in the summer. So I hope you'll get that book, read it, and then we're going to have virtual small groups to talk about it. This is a part of our commitment to work on our own uh, white privilege, our own white supremacy, and learn about that together as a community. And finally, we will have Together at 10 right after the service. So we hope you'll join us for our virtual Together at 10. And now we'll begin worship with the lighting of the candle. We want to do this all together as a community. And so Reverend Leo is going to light our Christ candle. We hope you have a candle on your altar space by your communion elements. And you can light that with us.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Adapted poem continue by Maya Angelou. My wish for you is that you continue. Continue. To be who and how you are to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Continue. To allow humor to enlighten the burden of your tender heart. Continue. In a society dark with cruelty to let the people hear the grandeur of God and the peals of your laughter. Continue. Continue. To let your eloquence elevate the people to heights they have only imagined. Continue. To remind the people that each is as good as the other and that no one is beneath nor above you. Continue. Continue. To put the mantle of your protection around the bodies of the young and defenseless. Continue. Continue. To take the hand of the despised and diseased and walk proudly with them in the high street, some might see you and be encouraged to do likewise. Continue. Continue. To ignore no vision which comes to enlarge your range and increase your spirit. Continue. To dare to love deeply and risk everything for the, for the good thing. Continue. Continue. And by doing so, you and your work will continue eternally. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back The world behind me The cross before me The world behind me The cross before me The world behind me The cross before me no turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning Good morning. Today's lesson comes from the book of Jonah, the third chapter, verses 1 through 10. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And when you get there, you will find. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. 
Then he made a proclamation. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered in sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change God's mind. God may turn from God's fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed God's mind about the calamity that God had said God would bring upon them, and God did not do it. May God bless the hearers and the doers of God's holy word. I say thank you to Miles for reading the call to worship for us, to Jessica Fisher for that beautiful bassoon solo, and the Reverend Martina Effigy who read us the passage from Jonah. And Reverend Martina Effigy will be our preacher this morning, and we are very grateful to her for bringing the word to us today. So. We'll keep her in our prayers as we have our time of centering now. It's always good to pray for your preacher. <laughs> At Emmanuel, we like to take a long time to center ourselves. We know that silence is a gift, that sometimes it takes a while to bring our mind and our bodies back together. 
So we're going to enjoy a time of silence. I hope that you're sitting comfortably. If it helps you, you could close your eyes. Or you could focus on the flame of your candle. Sometimes that's a helpful tool to bring you back together, mind and body. And we're going to enjoy our breath for a minute before Reverend Martina brings the word to us. Oh God, we call upon you open our eyes, soften our hearts, help us to th see the things that have been hidden, help us to face the things that we need to change as individuals as a church, as a nation, as a world. We know that we cannot change things that we do not face. So help us, Lord, to be honest about our confessions, our repentance, our willingness to listen, to hard truths. Help us to remember that you love us. For in this way, we are able to hear hard things. We pray now for Reverend Martina as she brings the word to us. Help us to listen. Amen. Good morning, Emmanuel. The title of my sermon today is When God's Yes is Louder Than Our No. 
and it comes from the book of Jonah, the third chapter, verses 1 through 10. As a deacon, I serve in an appointment beyond the local church in the field of mental health as an art therapist and counselor. For the past 12 years, I've worked with a variety of clients from all walks of life, but one challenge that seems to plague them all, regardless of their social location, is maintaining healthy boundaries and relationships. According to movement facilitator Prentice Hemphill, boundaries are the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. However, there are those among us who seem more willing to allow their healthy boundaries to be breached if it means that they can avoid having hard conversations with difficult people. So in an effort to keep the peace, they might say yes when they really mean no, and they might say okay to things that make them feel uncomfortable. They may even hold back expressing their true feelings to people who've offended them for fear that doing so might drive those folks away altogether. However, in the age of COVID-19 and the new global civil rights movement that it is spawning, calling a thing a thing or speaking truth to power has become increasingly necessary. As was the case for our sibling Jonah in the text, this scary, uncertain, tumultuous political, social, and economic climate that we've now found ourselves in is our big fish. It has swallowed up our distractions and reshuffled all of our priorities. And for those of us who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ, perhaps it is just the opportunity that we need to finally make good on our promise to do justice and to learn how to walk our talk. Avoiding the hard and difficult things is one way to survive, but beloved, I submit to you that it is not necessarily the best way to live. When working with clients who struggle in this way, I often find myself saying the same thing. You do not have to set yourself on fire to keep others warm. Even though they have sacrificed their all to appease the tempestuous situations in their life, the storms rage around them nonetheless. And when faced with the difficult task of hurling the source of their anguish into the abyss too, and hope for the best, they often respond in the same way. No, there has got to be another way. It is at this point that I tell them that I can recognize that the process of mourning is, is underway in their life. When I think of mourning, it reminds me of the D acronym DABDA, which I learned in grad school when it comes to understanding the process of grief and loss. DABDA stands for denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and ultimately acceptance. In my opinion, it is best to understand grief, in a cyclical pro grief as a cyclical process rather than a linear one. So whenever I notice that my clients are cycling through the stages of grief rapidly, to keep the session afloat, I will often reframe my approach as they work through their feelings and emotions. For many of my clients, this realization the realization that sometimes you've just got to let go in order to save yourself or that as humans that we don't always have the right answers or any of the answers or that even though there are some things that we can do to better our lot there are some things that only god can do this reality can be heartbreaking to hear for those of us who live in the yes we can and self-made culture and for many of my clients, it brings about countless tears and profound sadness. But in reading the text, we find that my clients are not alone in their predicament. I imagine that they must feel just as distraught and demoralized as the king of Nineveh after learning of his great city's impending doom. Following Jonah's pronouncement that Nineveh would be overthrown in 40 days time they probably also felt just as terrified and defeated as the governor of Hawaii was several years ago when he learned that a ballistic missile was on its way to the island and that residents had just minutes to take shelter. Or perhaps they were as frightened as the peaceful protesters who, without warning, were driven off of St. John's patio by law enforcement officers with tear gas, concussion grenades, and rubber bullets to make way for 45's photo op. Fear is a powerful force that can cause people to do crazy things. Fear of the unknown, 
fear of not having the right answers, or fear of being ill-prepared to handle the raging storms that life can bring. The raging storms that cause can cause any of us to throw up our hands and relent, but God. Now, from the moment that we're introduced to Jonah in the text, we can see that he's a runner, but it is impossible to fully appreciate how his track skills play a role in our lesson today without unpacking his backstory. In chapter one of the same book, we find Jonah receiving a call from the Lord to get up and go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before the Lord. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and was the arch enemy of Israel. The prophet Nahum described Nineveh as being a city of bloodshed, all deceit and full of plunder. Although we are unsure of Jonah's actual reasons for fleeing the first time around, his reluctance seemed understandable. The Lord was essentially asking him to preach before the enemies of God. So immediately after hearing this message, Jonah ignored the Lord's command and headed west, which is in the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. Jonah essentially wasted zero time in disobeying the Lord's call on his life and voted with his feet instead. But the funny and ironic thing about Jonah is that his name means faithful son of Yahweh's truth. His actions, however, suggested that he was anything but that. He boarded a boat, headed toward Tarshish, paid the fare, and went to sleep in the bottom of the same boat. He did all of this in an attempt to get away from the Lord. For those of us who recognize that we serve a God who is omnipresent, the idea of getting away from the Lord may sound strange. But for the readers of the text, and for those living around the ancient world, many people believed that their gods were localized. Yahweh was Israel's God. And the writer may be suggesting that Jonah thought that Tarshish was out of Yahweh's jurisdiction. Well, if that was his thinking, he was certainly wrong about that. Once the ship set sail, Yahweh made it known that there would be no hiding place. Yahweh sent a great storm that threatened to break up and sink the ship. Fearing for their lives, the sailors flung all their cargo overboard to make the ship lighter so that they could ride out the storm. They even began praying to their individual gods for help and deliverance. Now, when all this was going on, Jonah was fast asleep. The ship's officers descended below deck and commanded him to get up and call on his God so that they wouldn't all die. How many of you know that there are no atheists in the foxhole? When the going gets tough and when rubber meets the road, most people will find something to believe in. During the time when the text was written, people believed that storms were signs of an angry God. In an effort to figure out the source of God's displeasure, the sailors cast lots, which is similar to throwing the dice. When the lot fell on Jonah, they immediately began interrogating him to figure out the who, what, when, where, and why of their predicament. It was at that point that Jonah fessed up and declared, well, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, the one who made the sea and the dry land. Really, Jonah? Really? You worship the Lord, huh? But all the while you are on the run from your call, you have all these folks' lives hanging in the balance because of your disobedience. On the one hand, Jonah claimed to be a servant of the Lord, but on the other, he was actively disobeying the Lord's command. Much like the king in chapter three, the sailors must have been terrified at the prospect of certain death as they exclaimed, what have you done? And what do we need to do to you to make the sea calm down? Truth be told, if Jonah really wanted to obey the Lord and be a faithful servant of Yahweh's truth, at any point he could have said, mm, I don't know, why don't we just steer this boat in the direction of Nineveh? Because after all, the Lord asked me to go there in the first place. No, nope, not even close. He evaded responsibility yet again and entangled others in his mess by asking those on board to do what he himself was unwilling to do. He asked them to throw him overboard. Although some people look at Jonah's actions as being altruistic and self-sacrificing, I'm a bit more skeptical. To me, there still remains more defiance. Jonah wanted, even in what Jonah wanted in that moment, 
was death. As a mental health clinician, I'm intimately aware of this with this type of death wish. When a person is severely depressed, they can sometimes conflate the intense desire to end the suffering in their life with the intense desire to end their natural life. To them, they are one and the same. Ending one's natural life can put an end to the suffering and stop the bleeding. Because I view my role as a therapist as ministry, I can empathize with Jonah and take his actions for what they are. A delay tactic cloaked in narcissism. Death by drowning would have secured for Jonah what he wanted from the moment he received his call to flee Yahweh and perhaps flee from his own feelings of inadequacy and fear that he couldn't possibly pull off what Yahweh was asking him to do. So his supposed concern for the well-being of the sailors may have worked to camouflage his own selfish motives, fear, and nervousness. Deception and irony enveloped Jonah and entangled the well-meaning moral sailors whose emotions and efforts were fully invested in him. Fearful of being punished, yet again because of their involvement with him, they did what he wouldn't do. They cried on Yahweh, the God who made heaven and the earth, the sea raging about them as they hurled Jonah into the abyss and hoped for the best. But God. While all of this was happening, God prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah whole. And that fish held on to him for three days and three nights. At the time, the Hebrews believed that resurrection was still possible up until the third day. By the fourth day, a person could be declared legally dead. That fish held on to Jonah for three full days and three full nights and took him within an inch of his life and left him on the brink of death before it vomited him, vomited him out right where he needed to be in Nineveh. Now, there are a lot of people who will go to great lengths to try and explain how such a miraculous thing could happen from a scientific standpoint. But how many of you know that there are times in life when a situation can be so all-consuming, so dark, so dank, so unbearably long that it forces us to turn our attention to the creator? How many of you know that there are situations, relationships, and encounters that have to hold on to us just long enough for the change God commanded in us to take root? Sometimes we may think that we are being buried alive when in reality we are just being planted. But even after all of that, Jonah emerges in chapter three on the shore of Nineveh, still defiant, still disobedient, and still unwilling to offer God his all. If you leave here today thinking that Jonah showed up ready to put in work for God, I have failed miserably at my task. For in the text, we find the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim the message that I tell you. Now, to his credit, Jonah did get up. He did go into the city about a third of the way, but he did not speak with thus saith the Lord. Instead, Jonah went rogue. He ignored the precedent of generations of prophets before him and instead used the platform God gave him to deliver his own message, which essentially said, Y'all got 40 more days here before your city is toast. Much like the text message that went out to the folks living in Hawaii, his message was cold, devoid of hope, devoid of compassion, and offered the people of Nineveh no opportunity or direction on how to turn their lives and potentially their fate around. Just like the people of Hawaii were given 40 minutes to figure out what to do with the rest of their lives, Jonah offered a city of 120,000 souls 40 days to figure all, everything out on their own. Oh, but God, not only had Jonah underestimated the people of Nineveh and its leadership, he underestimated the power of God to override his foolishness and bring about the expected end nonetheless. 
The fate of Nineveh did not rely on Jonah, just like the fate of our country does not rely on the competence, compassion, or common decency of our elected officials. And thank God for that. Perhaps it is when God's yes is louder than our no, God can use our life experiences and sometimes our own disobedience to grow us into the servant that God needs us to be. In giving a TED talk on the takeaways from Jonah's story, it is clear that when God's yes is louder than our no, first and foremost, we must recognize that we serve a God of no take backs. Romans 11 and 29 reminds us that God's gifts and God's call are irrevocable. And God never changes God's mind when gifts are given and when someone is called. There are simply no take backs. The leader of the faith, the, the intentional faith development ministry, my former church, came up to me one Sunday and said, Rev, I've got a confession to make. I think I might be on the run. He said, I always have a ready made excuse for every scenario. You name it. And I can come up with why I shouldn't serve in this or that capacity or why I should just keep my mouth shut. And talking with him, I recalled a poem I was required to commit to memory while pursuing membership in my sorority. It said, excuses are tools of the incompetent. They build bridges to nowhere. And those faulty people who use them become, monu mo become monuments of nothingness, nothingness, nothingness. As followers of Christ, we are not called to mediocrity. We are called to do great things in Jesus' name. Yes, we may have the right to remain silent, but in doing so, we must ask ourselves, whose lives are hanging in the balance when we who have a voice fail to use it? God knew that Jonah was full of it when God called him, but the calls never stopped coming. God came to Jonah a second time in chapter three and continued to pursue him until he finally gave in. In saving the people of Nineveh, God was also throwing out a lifeline to Jonah. God is persistent in God's pursuit of us and will always persevere despite our resistance. When we purposely fail to walk in the anointing and authority that God has granted us by virtue of our baptism, we are walking in disobedience and we just may be setting ourselves up to get swallowed by one of the Lord's appointed calamities. Jehovah Jireh is our provider who even makes provision for us in the midst of our sin and uncertainty. And if ever we attempt to hide from God in one place, rest assured we will encounter, encounter God's presence in another. The second takeaway that is that when God's yes is louder than our no, we recognize that the grace of God will not take us where the will of God cannot keep us. We serve a God of provision and bounty. If God has called you to it, God will see you through it. In the movie, The Queen of Catway, the main character could outsmote pretty much all of her chess opponents because she could think eight steps ahead of them. When we worship the God who made the heaven and the earth, the God who made the sea and the dry land, the one who breathed the breath of life into each and every one of our nostrils, the one who gave us a hope and a future, when we truly recognize that God for who that God is, the one who came before, we will realize that God is more than light years ahead of us at all times, preparing the way and ensuring that the conditions are ideal for our arrival. It is this God who orders our steps, for the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. We worship a God who sits high and who looks low. We worship a God who is the author and finisher of our faith and who promised to never leave us nor forsake us, even when, like Jonah, we have given up on ourselves. And lastly, when God's yes is louder than our no, we recognize that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to God's purpose. Just the other day, I was flipping, flipping through the footage of the protests when I caught the glimpse of this beautiful, bright-eyed, brown-skinned little girl. It was a six-year-old daughter of George Floyd. She was sitting atop the shoulders of her uncle and was grinning from ear to ear. She was looking out over the sea of protesters and mourners when she suddenly belted out, Daddy changed the world. Even in her own grief and profound loss, 
she was able to see a faint glimmer of hope that we adults often struggle to see, which is that no weapon is formed against us shall prosper and that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus our Lord. Even the worst that our enemies can do within their limited human power, it is still working together for good. Even if we do not re directly receive that good. Ultimately, Jonah's disobedience positioned Nineveh to do great things for God. It helped them dig deep and discover an authentic praise and worship that was not reliant on what God could do for them. Beloved, each of us individually and the whole of us collectively were bought with a price and we have been called to glorify the Lord our God. It is not by chance that we are positioned in this region, in this country for such a time as this. The body of Christ needs our willingness, our obedience, and our living sacrifice. Those who are struggling to breathe under the callous knees of racism, white supremacy, homophobia, transphobia, and the like, need us to stand up and use our voice to call out evil whenever and wherever we find it, even if that evil exists amongst our own family members and friends. We are called to be both salt and light in an unsavory and dark world. A while back, I was spending some time with my little cousin. She's the only child of two lawyers, so her deductive reasoning skills are at expert level. And as a self-professed agnostic, when I asked her what she thought of Christians, she said, they really have a hard time staying on message. She went on to list a number of troubling character traits, such as the fact that we can be hypocritical or judgmental at times. She summarized her thoughts by saying, Christians should do the right thing because it is right, not because it can save them from going to hell. Her words stung though they were completely relevant for the days in which we live. The reality is that the unchurched, the de-churched among us need a fresh word and witness, and it is up to us to show up and deliver. As followers of the Most High God, it is our responsibility to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. We've got to find new ways of connecting to the very real needs and concerns of this world. Without fear, and without losing our soul. When we are willing to say yes, when God calls on us to do great things, we have the opportunity to participate in God's redemptive work in the world and transform our communities in new, different, and necessary ways. It is my prayer that you will heed God's call when it comes, and it is also my prayer that you be blessed. We give thanks now for Reverend Martina's words to us. We'll take some time to mull them over. Thank you so much, Reverend Martina, for preaching for us today. We want to switch now to a celebration of our graduates. It's been a hard year for people who are graduating unable to have uh, ceremonies that they were looking forward to for a long, long time, to spend time <clears throat> with family and friends celebrating. So we are, we see you, graduates. We want to honor you. Thank you for sending in your pictures. And we'll enjoy now a slideshow of the graduates of Emmanuel. We're proud of you.
We'll join now in our prayer of confession and pardon. We do this when we, before we celebrate communion as a way to put our hearts, our minds into a posture of confession an openness to hear God's pardon, a willingness to be fed by the sacrament and to go out and work in the world. Today, our confession and pardon is a litany for racial justice. It's based on the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. It's by Katya Okachoff. God has told you what is good. The crowds shout, no justice, no peace. The prophet says, love kindness. The people cry, hands up, don't shoot. The people lament, I can't breathe. The prophet says, walk humbly with your God. The faithful have no choice. They walk and they pray. And they stand between the innocent and the would-be perpetrators. God has told you that justice is good. God has told you that kindness is good. God has asked you to walk humbly. And so you must walk. Amen. Friends, greet one another and say, peace be with you. And your response, and also with you. Peace be with you. And if you want to sign it, peace to you. This morning, you are invited for a holy communion in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not a loaf of bread you see on my plate on the screen. The body of Christ is not even the bread on your own table. The body of Christ is us as we are strengthened by the sharing together in this meal for hope and grace and presence. Presence on this communion table this morning is a mask and hand sanitizer, which are symbols of care of the body of Christ. As Jesus might have said, the realm of God is here. When we wear a mask of compassion and use hand sanitizer so that we all will be served and be safe. We pause to honor with tender memory the holy table in our church home, and to consecrate with love for all God's children, 
that many holy tables in our home churches. And now we'll sing our communion responses. They're printed up on the screen. I'm going to sing the leader parts and you will join in on the all parts. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We remember the Creator blessed all creatures and all human beings with plants of the ground and the fruit of the trees. We remember Sarah's hospitality to the angels, the manna in the wilderness, the oil that never gave out, the psalmists speaking down to the ages, taste and see that God is good. We remember. We remember a 12-year-old at the Passover in Jerusalem a meal cooked by Peter's mother-in-law, a small boy's lunch, Zacchaeus' feast, Martha's one-dish hospitality, a story about a fatted calf and dancing, another Jerusalem Passover, the broken bread in Emmaus, and the fish on the beach, we remember. We remember communal dining inspired by the Holy Spirit, Peter's unkosher dream that meant that all God's children are accepted, Paul's communion on the sinking ship, and a vision of fruit on the trees in the new Jerusalem, we remember our tables as various as these, and they are as truly the meal of grace, blessed by the Creator, Christ, and the indwelling Spirit. This is the table of remembrance. Whenever we gather here, we remember all the mighty acts of God. We also remember all those who've gone before us, those who brought us to the table. We think about those who will come in the future to this table. We think about those who we wish would feel the hospitality and would feel that they too are welcome at this table. And so we join with all of those people, those who have died, those who are yet to come, and those with us now as we say together this prayer of thanksgiving to God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is not only a table of remembrance, it is a table of presence. The presence of Christ with us. And we are the body of Christ. We are dispersed and gathered at the same time. This has always been true, even though we do not always see it. Like the grains that become one loaf, like the notes that are woven into a song, like the droplets of water that are blended into the sea, we as Christians, 
one body shall become. And so we say together now the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In your many kitchens and living rooms, Holy Spirit, come upon these elements which we set aside today to be a sacrament. Let us ask God's blessing upon them and upon us and upon all those who are in our prayers this morning. Gentle host, rest upon us as you rested on the water and the light and earth, and creatures, and human beings, all in your image. And the Holy Sabbath, send your spirit of life, and of love, power, and blessing upon all your children who are staying at home, so that this bread may be broken and gathered in love, and this cup be poured out to give hope to all risen, to all. Risen Christ, live in us, that we may live in you. Breathe in us, that we may breathe in you. Amen. It's always good to remember the prayer that Jesus taught. Please join me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved, we celebrate an open table in the United Methodist Church. This means everyone is welcome. This is God's table. It is not our table. And there is a place setting for you with your name on it. You don't need to be a member of United Methodist Church. You don't even need to be baptized. It is God who invites you. And so we break our bread together now. And we remember Christ's broken body for us. And we lift up our cup and we give thanks for it. We ask God to bless it. And we remember Christ who offered us the cup of salvation, a chance to begin anew again and again and again and again. I invite you now to receive communion in your homes and feel the body of Christ with you as we all commune together. Amen.
If you'd stand now for our benediction, you can put your hands out in a posture of receiving. Go forth now, beloved. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. Amen. Amen.